Hello again everybody and here's our summary for the 3rd of June. The Air Forces operated at approximately 50% of maximum effort as planned. Allied Expeditionary Air Forces continued to attack coastal radar installations, coastal batteries, bridges, and railway targets, flying over 2,000 sorties, about half of which were on offensive operations. So this easing up across the Air Forces over this couple of days gives the maintainers time to get the aircraft squared away and working perfectly and gives the pilots a bit of a rest because from the landings forward it's going to require just all out effort for sustained periods so you have to manage people and machines so that operations can peak at the right time and that peak is coming up here in a few days at 2130 hours group captain stag this is eisenhower's chief meteorologist presented a picture of the weather prospects for the period of monday to wednesday the fifth through the seventh that was definitely gloomy so we're coming up on a decision point for that planned landing on the 5th. So let's have a look and see what our three squadrons are doing on the 3rd. 441, the squadron moved into permanent billets on Ford Station and packed its tents, camp kits, and other equipment so as to be ready for the B echelon move, sending all that equipment they had been living in up to this point over to the ALGs in Normandy once they are opened up. 12 of our aircraft swept to Amiens St. Just area, destroying two military transports northwest of Montdidier and an additional one at Bretteville. And on the map, I already have these plotted out, and the color code I'm going to use until I find something better is have the 441 squadron in red, 442 in white, 443 in blue. So you can see the overview as we go here. Now let's check up on 442 squadron for the third. Squadron up earlier this morning, packed, struck tents, and by 0930, loaded six-ton trucks, moved to the aircrew site, Reached at 1100, and 9 took off at 1325, led by Flight Lieutenant Dowding. We have here scratched out after the fact, 4 returned quickly when belly tanks would not work. And we're going to see this more and more as we get into the descriptions and the narratives here of belly tanks on these Spitfires being inoperative, to the point where later on in the campaign there's going to be a directive from 83rd Group that drop tanks are not to be used in Spitfire operations. But that's yet to come. And these longer range missions are flown with drop tanks. The others returned to 1510 after strafing trucks and transports in France, ran into some fairly accurate flak. One cannon, Flight Lieutenant Dowding, one wing, Flight Lieutenant Wright, and one tail, Flight Officer Morse, damaged and all jet tanks jettisoned. Again, referring to those centerline drop tanks. A new pilot, but known to several of the squadron, was welcomed today, Flight Lieutenant Dover, and Flight Officer Godwin ferried an Anson from Red Hill. Total flying time, 18 hours, 5 minutes. And I'll show an Anson here, just a twin-engine, light, trainer, transport-type aircraft, of which one or two are assigned to squadrons, just for general purpose use. Now, 443 Squadron, we have weather cloudy and warm, quite hazy, squadron on readiness, or standing alert, from 0430 hours, ceasing at 2322 hours. Orders received from number 144 wing that the squadron was to leave the wing for static station Aria Ford at 0900 hours a day. This meant moving from tents into temporary quarters, Nissen huts, on the aircrew's side Ford. All camp equipment and the greater part of officers' personal baggage has been packed in the one three-ton lorry assigned to the squadron for any movements. Aircraft servicing being done by static station personnel and those members of the servicing echelon who are on the airlift party. Pilots of the squadron are keeping only as much kit as can be carried in a Spitfire aircraft when the squadron eventually moves overseas. The adjutant and two airmen on squadron strength who are proceeding by airlift party are taking all their baggage with them by transport plane. A start has been made on painting the white stripes on squadron aircraft in accordance with Tactical Air Force instructions on aircraft markings. And a second new Spitfire was flown in from Red Hill today. Operational flying time, 19 hours, 40 minutes. Non-ops time, 3 hours, 5 minutes. And this is the first mention here of this really last minute and sometimes grumbled about painting of invasion stripes on the aircraft, which, as much of a pain as this would have been to do last minute, it does pay off when it comes to being able to identify aircraft later on in the campaign, as we'll see. So that's the overview, and even though the Air Forces in general are making it sort of a half day, just a recuperation day, 144 wing is taking advantage of some breaks in the weather to mount a wing size fighter sweep with all three squadrons going out at the same time to the same location. So now to look at the individual missions, 442 squadron would have been up first on their Sweep, 2 MET destroyed Bretteville, November 1428 for coordinates, 
and then flak moderate inaccurate at hotel number 555 and that's another transcription of the grid coordinate that should be november 0555 it turns out so let me come in here to this area and that was two vehicles destroyed right there on that road on the way to or heading away from brick wheel and on the way there or on the way back moderate inaccurate flak from the area of Amyan, right from this area. Now, as with yesterday's missions, most likely course of action here would have been for the squadrons to cross the coast and that heavy flak concentration that is usually around the coast at a moderate altitude and then go down to a lower level with the formation leads being very careful about navigation, not to overply any known flak concentrations. For example, I'm sure Amyan would not have been overflown directly. Airfields would have been avoided. The formation leads would do the navigation while the flight members just keep their eyes out for any aircraft or anything moving on the ground, calling out flak, for example, when it's past here, and calling out vehicles so that the entire squadron can coordinate and move in. Now, this would have been an entire wing going out there on more or less the same route, and I'll come over to the next squadron up, 443 Squadron, and they get airborne at 1330, weather cloudy and warm, 12 pilots breach at 1230 for a fighter sweep into the Amiens Paris area, Take off at 13.30, but only 11 aircraft left the ground. Flight Officer Irwin unable to get the engine started. Three more were first to return early, two due to jet tank trouble, and one other was mixed up in takeoff and unable to catch up to his section. And you can understand how that could easily happen, especially in this type of weather. In fact, it says right here, 8 tenths cloud at 6,500 feet and quite hazy near the ground. One locomotive, Cat C, at Troyalt, Mike 9747, and I have that plotted out right here on a rail yard that's uh, running in the area. And by Cat C, what I assume this is referring to, they're just sort of using aircraft condition terminology here. At the time, Cat C would have been just on the edge of being repairable. The next one down is just basically scrap it for parts. So I'm going to take that to mean that either the locomotive was damaged by this flight or that it was observed to be damaged at that location. Additionally, we have one MET destroyed and one damaged Mike 9949, and that's over here on another road. And in fact, this one's pretty close to a reconnaissance mission that flew through the area. We don't get the exact location here on the road shown, but you can see the overall character. And in going back to all these reconnaissance photos from the time, of course, the cities, the urban areas are pretty different now from what they were in World War II, but the countryside itself is very, very unchanged. These are very, very easy to find the locations. So this would have then, just as it was now, just have been out here on this little country road and we can see the rail line in the same place. Coming over here to where that locomotive was reported, Cat C, right here, possibly stopped at this little station. Now it goes on to say, very little movement observed on the highways or railways. Very little flak, no enemy aircraft were seen. So that's just going to leave the third squadron up just after those at 1345, flying until 1445, 441 squadron. And they state simply, Ramrod Mission 962, the squadron swept Amiens, St. Just area, two MET destroyed northwest of Montdidier, and one destroyed at Bretiville. So if we come in here to this area, same general area as the others, just MET on roads in this farmland, and then one other MET over here in the Bridge Wheel area. So that's it for that wing-sized fighter sweep, and it was just the same outcome for all three squadrons. Now we have one more mission. This is a shipping recon carried out by 443 Squadron. Let me see what they have to say about this one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 443 Squadron was standing alert, and they were scrambled on a shipping recce to Le Havre and Cherbourg area. And as they went, a heavy belting of accurate flak was received near Le Havre, but no damage. So, flak coming from the port area over here. Two unidentified aircraft sighted, but no opportunity to intercept. And they could have been enemy aircraft, but with this many Allied aircraft in the air, chances are they were just another flight, Allied flight in the area. Two large ships, classed and identified, laying three quarters of a mile offshore, eight miles east of Point de la Pierce, Tango 7687. Two large ships, believed to be destroyers, laying two miles offshore, seven miles south of St. Vost Le Havre, and that's actually not St. Vost Le Havre, that's, yeah, St. Vast Le Hogue. But that's the location. Suspect large number of small craft in Cherbourg Harbor, no other shipping seen. Intense, accurate flak from Cherbourg itself. And on a mission like that, anything of importance would have been radioed in, but the mission from takeoff to landing was about an hour, so it was probably just one big sweep out here in this area. 
Now there is a little bit of overhead imagery from the third. I was kind of hoping that maybe these two large ships out here might have been captured in some of it, but uh, these two strips right here were all low level just in preparation. This is capturing the terrain right here, just inland of Utah Beach. And wherever you see the two sort of parallel reconnaissance courses right there, they're taking stereo pairs so that these images could be processed and then placed side by side and the intelligence folks could look at these and pick out things that you wouldn't normally be able to pick out. Actual vertical construction, additional insight into the terrain. So that's what happened on the third and yeah, nothing as far as imagery is showing any of the other stuff, although I am hopeful that on the 6th we're going to be able to pick out some very specific items that are called out. So that's going to do it for this day. Successful fighter sweep, successful recon, and we'll move on into the 4th. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.